You're listening to Sustainable Colgate, an ongoing dialogue connecting the Colgate community, upstate New York residents, and the local ecosystem through current environmental issues. By connecting with fellow students, professors, and members of Madison County, we hope to raise awareness and promote a more sustainable community. We're your hosts, Anne-Marie Heinrich and Laura Wood. Project is a company aimed at fighting poverty and environmental justice through sustainable practice in the sale of tea and coffee. Shapna has partnered with small-scale farmers in impoverished areas of Bangladesh, Uganda, and the Dominican Republic to help free the farmers from debt and promote independent development. The project relies on a unique sustainable business model in which 40% of the profits are reinvested back into projects to achieve economic and environmental stability in the communities in which tea and coffee are both produced and consumed. Joining us today is Shopna's CEO and founder, Johnny Chocolater, who graduated from Colgate in 2003 with a degree in geology. He went on to pursue his Master's of Science degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico's Institute of Meteoretics in 2005. He subsequently obtained his Master of Business and Administration degree at Howard University School of Law and Business. While at Howard, Johnny started Shopna as a student-led project. By 2009, the Shopping Project was born. So thank you, Johnny, for joining us today. Our, uh, our first question um, is, what are the main injustices surrounding global tea and coffee production? Sure. Well, um, you know, by way of background, uh, initially, as you may know, uh, one of the founding principles of the Shopna Project and of the Shopna Tea and Coffee Company is to fight the injustices that surround tea and coffee production. Um, and the way that we do this is by partnering with specific communities that we've worked with. Um, and we dedicate 40% uh, of our net profits to fight those injustices. Um, in particular, when you're dealing with tea and coffee, um, the vast majority of the world's tea and coffee production happens um, on these massive uh, corporate estates that are thousands of acres in size, such that if you were to try to drive from one end of one of them to the other, it would take you more than a day to actually get, you know, get from one end of, of the estate to the other. Now, the size in and of itself is not a problem. What happens is um, the, the dehumanization of the workers in these estates um, that happens as a direct result of the massive size of these estates. And what I mean in particular is you have um, marginalized communities that are largely uh, lacking in education and um, that have very little bargaining power um, who find themselves in these estates and who are essentially in these indentured servitude types of arrangements where they're actually not paid in cash uh, for their services but they are promised uh, in exchange for their uh, services in growing and processing tea, they're, they're promised, um, you know, clothing, shelter, and um, minimal uh, livelihood and support for livelihood. Even if they wanted to leave this type of uh, system, they have no way of doing so because you literally cannot walk your way out of these estates, they're so large, and, and, and a lot of these families don't have means of transportation. Um, with the coffee production, you also have something that you have with tea production from an environmental standpoint. When you have um, such massive tracts of land in which you're doing monoculture, um, the integrity and the fertility of the soil diminishes considerably because there's a disproportionate use of chemicals and um, other kinds of artificial um, uh, growth stimulants. And as a result, you have decreasing yields year over year in some of these plots of land. And that adversely affects the farmers because the, if you have less to grow and you're not taking care of the soil, there really is no way to replenish that other than uh, either crop rotations or just stopping farming for a period of years. And when the land reaches that point, these massive estates, um, you know, the owners of these massive coffee and tea estates, instead of actually helping these farmers um, rebuild a means of livelihood and farming, they'll just leave. They'll pick up and they'll go somewhere else. 
so often that environmental and social issues are interconnected, as we've seen with so many different issues. Um, yeah, very much, yeah. Um, so how, how do you go about choosing which um, community Shopna partners with to, to grow tea and coffee? Well, uh, that's a great question. Right now, we only have two communities that we're working with that we have, um, you know, already developed relationships with. Um, one is in Tetulia, Bangladesh, which is the northernmost tip of the country. We went out and we first identified communities of people in these massive estates that were uh, willing to take a risk and willing to start their own um, small plots of land. Then we found out what kind of assets they have uh, that are disposable. A lot of these poor tea farmers had um, sheep and, and, and goats. And although the sheep were beneficial for these farmers, the only reason why they had these goats, for example, and, and these sheep is to try and diversify their, their income. They, they, were, they were trying to create um, micro opportunity for themselves uh, where they would be able to sell um, you know, uh, goat's milk or cheese or things of that sort amongst their own communities um, to try to sustain themselves. And so, but what the adverse effect of what was happening is that um, because they weren't getting enough from, from their tea livelihood, they essentially um, were overgrazing with these goats. And if you know anything about goats, they'll eat everything. They'll eat the roots of trees. They'll, they essentially decrease the quality of land even more. And they were a huge pain in the rear for these folks. And, um, you know, they said that it was more a labor of love. Um, you know, it, it, they had to rely on these goats for alternative, uh, you know, means of diversifying their income. So we asked them uh, to, basically what we asked them to do was um, we, we realized that each individual farmer had very little purchasing power, but that collectively they actually had a, uh, they had enough goats where if we sold those goats, we would be able to give, we would be able to transfer enough funds to help them buy a small plot of land that they'd be able to run by themselves. And that's what we did. You know, so that, that was our test community with the tea. And in Uganda, for our coffee, we looked at a community that was already, um, you know, uh, one step, you know, further along in this process where they had already made that investment in themselves. Um, they were, uh, in Uganda, largely uh, refugee communities from neighboring uh, conflict areas. And they moved into, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the Eastern Highlands to start a new life for themselves. And they had already purchased these tiny, small plots of land for themselves by essentially doing what we helped our tea farmers do. They got rid of assets that were not helping them. And, and so we, we looked at that community and they, um, and we looked at the soil profiles and we saw that, you know, it's a, it's a good region to be growing, um, the kind of coffees that we think are the most delicious and flavorful. And, and, and then that, that partnership took off. So right now, those are the two communities that we're partnered with. Um, we've also explored a little bit with a uh, Dominican Republic coffee co-op um, out in Rio Olimpio, and that's still in its uh, formative stages. Uh, we're not we're not very far along with that yet, and it'll take some more time for us to do some feasibility studies to see whether that would work. But we, you know, our basic criteria is looking for communities that um, you know have the means to. Uh, you know, fight their own battle and where we can essentially help them. Awesome, that's great. Um, and then we currently understand that not only is money going back to the communities that grow it, but uh, money is also going back to communities that sell and purchase Shopna coffee. How has um, Hamilton, New York benefited from buying Shopna coffee? Sure. Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, when we reinvest in the communities that consume our coffee, we first look at the community. Uh, we we look at the community on a two-tier level. Um, the first tier is who are the direct consumers of the goods. Um, that's the that's the first tier. And then the second tier is what is the broader um, community where those direct consumers? How are they? impacting the broader surrounding that they happen to be in. Um, because our coffee and our tea products are available at Colgate's campus, uh, Frank Dining Hall, for example, has our coffee, um, and the barge also carries our coffee, um, our first direct uh, consumer are Colgate students. And so our first commitment is to try to expand opportunities for Colgate students to learn more about sustainability and contribute directly in the, um, uh, in basically the, 
you know, the, the, the way that we do business and, and learning more about how they can do their part. So we've dedicated over $10,000 to um, student research opportunities, for example. Now, the broader community, however, as you may know, uh, Madison County, Shenango County, reflects some of the most uh, poverty-stricken counties in the entire country. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily know that by walking around at Colgate immediately, but these, the students that uh, consume our products usually tend to be more socially conscious. They tend to be very informed. Um, they aspire to doing things to, you know, using their dollars as they would their votes. And so these are the same students that oftentimes partner with local uh, community establishments that are serving the community. And so we then reached out through the Cove and through the Upstate Institute to identify eight organizations that are ser serving underprivileged communities within, uh, or underprivileged and marginalized communities within the greater Madison uh, County and Hamilton areas. And this is all from you know, literally one air pot that is available at the barge and one air pot that is available at uh, Frank Dining Hall. And we hope that with, you know, more um, support from students, uh, we would be able to do even more and support a greater variety of organizations in Hamilton. So our last question for you is, uh, how did your time at Colgate contribute to the development of the Shopna project? You know, I whenever I think about Colgate, I, I just get a very warm and happy feeling inside because I'm one of the people that loves the university big time. Uh, I graduated in 2003, and I have to tell you, there is there are a few places on earth that are as, and it's sometimes not obvious when you're there and you're in the day to day, um, but there are a few places on earth that is so supportive of a person's need and drive and ability to literally envision anything. And I think that that's an important character of Colgate University as an institution and its students. The, the setting that, that Colgate provides for people helps them imagine that they can achieve absolutely anything. And that, from a, from a more mental and conceptual standpoint, was pivotal. I think that the liberal arts education that is available at Colgate really helps foster an out-of-the-box kind of thinking. But not just for me. The Schottner Project itself has um, had several uh, alumni from Colgate participate in various capacities. Um, Michael Tringali, he's one of our most important people in the organization. He's also a Colgate alum. Um, and he, he, we've developed the network um, amongst ourselves largely by meeting, meeting one another as students back in the day when we had no idea that we would, um, you know, 10 years down the line, uh, end up you know, collaborating together. And so, I mean, I, I think that the friendships that people maintain and you know, just the, the, you know, the, the everyday encounters, you're, you guys are amidst people who will become major uh, players in the business world. You, you guys are in the midst of people who will become major contributors in politics, in science, in, in academia. And it's hard to recognize that when you're there, but the relationships that you forge at Colgate are so important to the development of, you know, various exciting ideas. And so, I mean, I, I have to say that I don't think the Shotman Project would have been successful if it were not for the kind of experiences we developed. And also, Colgate has been um, amazing for the alumni community, too. I think there's a reason why the alumni community is so dedicated to Colgate. Um, Colgate really uh, opens its doors, not just while you're there on campus, but afterwards. The Shopman Project would not be where it is today without the support of Colgate University staff, faculty, and certainly, most importantly, of the students. Great. So it looks like we've got a lot to look forward to after <laughs> life after Colgate. Um, but we'd like to thank you, Johnny, for joining us today. Uh, it's been great, and we've learned a lot about Shopna. My pleasure. I look forward to uh, you know being available if you guys need anything else. Thanks so much.